resurrection of bodies today father i thank you break in father god today father i thank you for the sound of resurrection i thank you for the sound of light and i release resurrection over the airways today I release that sound of light of resurrection over the airwaves today father I thank you that you're coming and you're resurrecting prophetic dreams and promises you're resurrecting marriages and families that you're resurrecting your eternal purpose father and the sons and daughters and father I thank you for resurrection light today i thank you for a movement a firstborn movement a company being raised from the dead and i say new york city i speak light into you today and i speak light into that tomb and father i thank you shake the tomb of new york city shake the structures with light
purpose being resurrected in this nation and men and women those watching on the internet father i thank you for resurrection light hitting their spirit man today i thank you for a resurrection father of things they haven't even known or seen yet but today i say the eyes of your spirit are being opened to see the very reason the father fashioned you in his heart and put you in a womb at an appointed time so lord i thank you for light coming into them and i thank you for a shaking and a rattling in the earth father i thank you that the bones are rattling father i thank you father for a mighty army being raised up i thank you for the wind breathing in the men and women's lungs blowing coronavirus but blowing where the enemy's been trying to steal their wind and the breath of god i thank you father god for breathing into them father god i thank you i prophesy you will live and not die and i thank you for a resurrection today and i say enough is enough father god i thank you for a shift over this nation today we say enough is enough today father i thank you i release the sound of resurrection father from philadelphia to san diego from seattle to savannah i mark this nation with the covenant mark of the lord and i say enough is enough and i thank you for light breaking forth in cities i thank you for a sound that shakes the ground that shakes the tombs even cities that have been like a tomb i say sons of light come out of that tomb hey. I thank you and I hear Las Vegas father I thank you for a resurrection of sons of light that light up the night in Las Vegas father God I thank you for shifting the light I thank you for sons and daughters of the resurrection coming forth in Las Vegas and even as you have shut down 
that candling and you've shut down that natural light. Father, I thank you today on a true first fruits, a resurrection Sunday. I thank you for a resurrection. Father, I thank you that they're coming out of the tombs, Lord. I thank you for a movement of resurrection light. I thank you for a revival in Las Vegas, Lord, that you're plumb lining that city. And Father, I thank you for the crowned sons coming forth, Lord, even as you had me put that seventh bob in Las Vegas, that it is the crowned sun city. I thank you, Jesus. Be crowned in that city with glory and might, Lord. Let a movement arise in Las Vegas today in Jesus' name. the seventh day sun's coming forth and I hear can anything good come out of Nazareth and can anything good come out of the Nazarene church and I say there's a healing move coming out of the Nazarene church and I call forth I resurrect the eternal purpose of the Father I release light in the Nazarene church today and I say let healing arise in the Nazarene church can anything come good out of Nazareth, yes. And Father, I thank you for the mantle of John Wesley falling on Methodist pastors, Father. I, Father, I like the lampstand. Father, in the Methodist church, I release that fire upon that lamp that has gone out. And I thank you, Father, for that mantle, Father, that fell to the ground, being picked up, Father God. I thank you for shaking every denomination for shaking every movement and calling forth your eternal purpose, the very reason you raised them up. And they started at a movement, but things have grown dead. But we thank you on this Resurrection Sunday for a movement coming forth. And even if it's just a remnant, we say a remnant will arise with the eternal purpose of Yahweh. And so, Lord, I thank you in every denomination, in every family, in every bloodline. Father, your eternal purpose in every city. I say a remnant comes forth today. This is not just any day. This is not just any Resurrection Sunday. But it's the first day of a movement coming forth. This is the first day of a movement arising in the earth, even in Jerusalem. I thank you that the ground will shake once again as a sign, Lord, that the tombs will shake in Jerusalem, that you're resurrecting a movement that bears your image even in Jerusalem. Father God, I thank you for sons of light walking the streets of Jerusalem. Once again, opening blind eyes, opening deaf ears. By what authority do you do this? By the authority of the resurrected one, Yeshua HaMashiach. And I thank you, Father God, for a movement in Israel, Father God. Father God, I thank you for seven cities being lit up in the nation of Israel, for your menorah being lit up in that nation. Father God, I thank you for a worldwide movement. I thank you for a worldwide movement. And we say that death has no hold because you've been resurrected. And I thank you that death, coronavirus, has no hold on the nations. Thus says the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, let them go. Let the worshipers come forth on this Resurrection Sunday, a first fruit company lighting the lampstand of Yahweh. So, Father, I call them forth by your eternal word 
in Jesus' name. So, Father, we speak into the tombs of people's lives. Father, even on the Internet today, Father, for someone watching, they have no hope. They feel no future. They feel like their life is a tomb. I thank you for a resurrection of your eternal purpose. I thank you for light breaking the darkness, breaking the depression, and the oppression of the enemy. I thank you for a mantle like a warm blanket wrapping around them right now, the presence of God overtaking you, the embrace of the Father. Father is embracing you, and you are worthy. You say, I am not worthy of the embrace of the Father. You are worthy. I hear the Lord say, you are worthy by my blood. I make you. You're worth it. You're worth every drop. And I thank you for a resurrection. I say hope is coming forth. I say hope is arising in the tomb of your life. And you will give birth to the very purpose the Father has you on the earth. Father, we roll away the stone, the stony heart of family members. We roll away the stone. And we speak into that tomb. We say to the Lazarus, we say to the family members, just begin to call their name. We say, come forth. Come forth. We call you out of that tomb. We call you out of that dark place. We call you out of deadness. Jesus, we celebrate your resurrection. We celebrate you, that you were raised. So every one of our family members will be raised. And Lord, we thank you. We roll away the stones, Lord. We roll away the stony hearts, Lord. And we speak 
your word into that dark tomb, into that dark life. We call forth the eternal purpose of the Lord in you. Man of God, woman of God, come forth. Father God, I thank you for a resurrection. Jesus, I thank you for a resurrection today, Lord, in our families and family members, Lord. I thank you, Father, for a restoration. Hey. Oceans where you are, the love, the fall, the fire, the coast, the wind, the waves, the lakes, my heart be still. The earth is way, the mountains move into the sea, the nations rage. I know my God is in control. And I had a vision. So I went back to my just a quick snapshot. And I saw the middle of the United States, the map. And it began to shake. And I heard, this is the big one. And like people have a heart attack and say, this is the big one. And the Lord, I heard the Lord say, I'm shaking the heartland. I'm shaking the heartland, the heartland of America. I'm shaking the heart of this land. I'm shaking the heart of this land. And the big one is coming. But the big one, the shaking, is all about the awakening. So don't fear the shaking of the middle of the nation. Don't fear the shaking because the shaking is to awaken my eternal purpose for this land and restore my heart to this land. So, Father, I thank you for the heartland 
shaking. And I thank you that it will be a great awakening. And I thank you for the sound that shakes the ground and brings a movement from underground to above ground. And Father, I thank you for the hidden ones coming forth in this day. Those that have been hidden and cultivated and in hiddenness, Lord, I thank you that you're crowning them with governance. You're anointing them like your servant David, crowning them to bring the giant down. And I thank you, Father, for this sound shaking the ground and causing a movement to come out today on this resurrection. So watch the heartland shake. And it is a sign of the awakening. So, Father, we thank you. We do not fear the shaking. Even of family members, as they begin to shake, do not fear the shaking. Because the Father is awakening his purpose in them. The shaking is purposeful because they're not waking up. They're not discerning the time. So, Father, not the hand of the enemy, not the hand of man, but your hand and your hand alone. We trust your leadership. We say not the hand of the devil, not the hand of man, but the hand of Yahweh. And I submit myself to your hand. I submit my family to your hand. I submit this nation to your hand and your hand alone. And I thank you that the shaking will cause an awakening and cause everything else to fall to the wayside. And the heart, your eternal purpose, will come forth with a great awakening in Jesus' name. Go ahead. Lord, you with us, with us in the fire, with us as a shelter, with us in the storm. You will lead us through the fiercest battle. Oh, where else will we go? We're with the Lord of us. And Lord of hosts, you with us, with us in the fire, with us as a shelter, and with us in the storm. You will lead us through the fiercest battle. Oh, where else would we go with the Lord of us? The oceans roar, you are the Lord of all, the one who calms the wind and waves and makes my heart be still. Be still, my soul. The earth gives way, the mountains move into the sea, the nations raise. I know my God is in control. The oceans roar, you are the Lord of all, the one who calms the wind and waves and makes my heart be still. The earth gives way, the mountains move into the sea, our nations rage. I know my God is in control.
So Still my 
Lord, in every home, see Maliana, let the wind blow today. Let the literal wind blow in every home. See Maliana, let them feel it, Lord. She Maliana, say I am a say. She Maliana, no, 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 no. I release the wind into your home today. I release the wind on your spirit, man, today. I release the breath of Yahweh upon you today. That's what I hear. Shema, no, 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 be revived. He's reviving your heart. He's awakening your heart. He's awakening your heart. He's going to awaken the heart of this nation. By awakening your heart. Song of Solomon 5.2 Though I'm asleep, my heart is awake. And I say your heart will be awake even in the nighttime season. That you're going to dream the dream of the king. Even while you sleep, your heart will be in communication with the Lord. I thank you, Lord, for a season of night visions. I thank you for a season of blueprints in the night. I thank you for a season of angels ascending and descending in the nighttime season. I thank you that you're rending the veil over people's beds, Lord, that angels are going to ascend and descend with divine revelation. Lord, I thank you for your kiss upon their heart, Lord. I thank you. No veil. Even in the nighttime season, your heart's going to be awake. And I thank you for a great awakening. I thank you for awakening our hearts that we're going to feel again like we've felt with that first kiss, the first time you kissed us with your presence. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for that kiss upon our hearts today. Thank you for the kiss of revelation of your presence. Lord, as people feel stuck, Lord, I thank you. You have them in a cocoon right now. They're just in a cocoon, and Lord, after this season, they're not going to crawl in the dirt, you said, like a caterpillar. But they're going to catch the wind. They're coming out of quarantine, catching the wind, releasing the seven colors of your spirit everywhere they go. They're going to catch your breath. And so, Lord, I thank you that this quarantine is just a cocoon. And, Lord, I thank you. Let the old things die and let us form wings to catch the wind that we will soar upon the wind of the Spirit. You said those that position themselves in hope and expectation that wait upon you will receive a divine exchange, that they will receive strength instead of weariness, that you'll come in their weariness and give them a divine exchange. So, Father, I thank you in their cocoon at home. I thank you that there's a transformation of a nation that's taking place and what the enemy meant for evil. I thank you, Father God, that when the church comes out, there's going to be a remnant that comes out manifesting the seven colors of the Spirit of God and the seven voices of the Lord. And I thank you, Lord, that they will soar and they will no longer climb, crawl in the dirt, but they will climb upon the heights of the mountains and they will soar upon the wind and they will see from above and not below. So Father, I thank you where all they could see is dirt and obstacles and obstructions. I say that season is dead, that you're going to catch the wind, the breath of Yahweh and he's transforming you into the beautiful one that he's destined for you to be. So I say catch the wind. Lord, and I thank you that today's the end of the quarantine. Resurrection. 
not necessarily Passover, but resurrection. And I thank you, Father, even when they came up out of uh, Israel, or they came up out of Egypt, and the obstacle of the Red Sea, Exodus 14, 13, he said, stand still and see the Yesha of Yahweh, the salvation. Stand still and see Yeshua sent by Yahweh. See the salvation of the Lord. Stretch forth your rod. So, Father, I stretch forth the rod of your word over the obstacles of people's lives. And I thank you that they're coming out of the tomb of Egypt. Right there's the picture. You're coming out of the tomb of Egypt. And you're coming into the promise. And you're making a seven-week journey to the mountain of God where the crown comes down. An authority that no generation has ever walked in. And I thank you for a covenant marriage at that mountain. I thank you for a divine exchange. The church of the firstborn. Birth from Zion, the place of your face. I thank you for the unveiled face army coming off Zion. I thank you for this movement that you've set this time. And I thank you that today is the end of the quarantine. Be free in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you. We're not quarantined by the word of man, but we're quarantined by the word of the Lord. And when you say, go, we go. And when you say, do, we do. And I thank you that we're crossing into promise, into that promised man that you've destined for one generation to walk in the full stature of the image of your son, to be the finished man, the finished body of Messiah that bears your image, that releases your kingdom. And I heard again a message that the Lord gave me about four or five years ago on Resurrection Sunday. I was studying about, and I wanted to release the roar from the tomb. And I began to study, and only one time you, you see that Jesus is called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. That's in Revelation 5, 5. 29 times in the New Testament, he's called the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He's called the Lamb of God. And so I thank you. And the Lord said, Son, the roar of the Lion of Judah is released through the lifestyle of the Lamb. And when you follow my lifestyle, it will release my roar. When you love your enemies and pray for those that persecute you, it will release a roar that will rebuke every devouring enemy. Every time you give instead of grab, it releases a roar that sets your finances free. Come on. The Lord says that the roar of the lion is released through the lifestyle of the Lamb of God. It's called the Lamb's Book of, what, of Life. He says, see, the, the bride has made herself ready. The wife of the Lamb. The 12 apostles, it says in a Revelation 21, the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And so Jesus, teach us to release your roar through your lifestyle. To live without limits and boundaries to love without limits and boundaries to release your limitless love in the earth that will release a roar that will rebuke coronavirus to walk with confidence in time with you touching even those with coronavirus because you said so not out of human zeal not out of human striving or trying to build a ministry but we would walk in time with you. And if you put coronavirus on our path, that we would touch it, knowing just as you touched the leper, that you were not contaminated, but you contaminated the leper with light, with resurrection. And I thank you for a body that bears your image with healing in their hands, with resurrection words in their mouth, that with a word will come out with a word blind eyes will open and I open the blind eyes of the body of Messiah I open my blind eyes with the word not that originates from me but from the throne of God I say Ed Watts let your eyes be open today to see with unveiled face I say let the eyes of the body of Messiah be open and we receive the light today we do not reject the light we receive the light. We conceive the light. And we give birth to the movement of light. 
We receive the light. Let it be done unto me according to your light, your word. Even as Mary conceived that seed of light, that word, and gave birth to a movement. I thank you, Father, that you're coming to the tombs and they're becoming wombs that give birth to a movement of resurrection, light, and life. Sons of light. Sons and daughters of the resurrection. And I thank you, even in the Torah reading today of Exodus 13, the ordinance of the firstborn. I thank you for the firstborn, your body being raised from the dead, your double portion, sons and daughters, that release your kingdom come and your will be done. Lord, I thank you, Father, today for that awakening of the heart in your body so as we open the scroll today and look at the scripture lord i thank you for lightning strikes as uh, pastor josh speaks father god i thank you for lightning strikes from your throne out of his mouth striking our hearts striking regions father i thank you and the lord would say to his people the Lord would say, you're not just preaching to people, but you're preaching to the land. That I will give you authority to speak to the land and bring healing to the land. So lift your eyes a little higher. And Lord, I thank you for this movement of resurrection. And I thank you, Father, everywhere they walk, they release light. With every footstep as they walk in divine sync and harmony with you. They release light that shakes the ground and expels darkness. Father, I thank you that when they walk into Kroger or Sam's Club or Myers, that they just change the temperature in the room. because And they change the atmosphere. They shift and they part the waters of people's lives and bring a word of resurrection. Father God, I thank you. And I say you will walk different because you'll see different from this day. You'll no longer walk the same because you're going to see with unveiled face. And so I thank you for the lifting of the veil, for the rolling away of the stone, and a movement coming out of the tomb and the grave. I thank you coming up out of the cocoon. It's time to fly. So we receive your word that you put upon Joshua's heart today. Moses is dead, but Joshua comes forth. I thank you, Father, for a movement of apostolic teachers, Father, in the Lamb, the teaching priests, as in the day of Hezekiah, we call them forth from Flint. As you've raised Joshua up to be a first fruit, Father God, I thank you for teaching priests. Father God, I thank you for Bishop Airport, that it is a priestly airport. Father God, I thank you for this city, that it is a flint knife in the hand of a Joshua generation. Even as you told Joshua to make flint knives and roll away the reproach to circumcise once again a second circumcision to roll away the reproach off the covenant people of God. I thank you for a teaching movement that becomes a flint knife, Father God. That, that airport will be a priestly commissioning airport that people will go out. I thank you for rolling away the reproach off the body of Messiah so they could go and take whole cities like Jericho, commissioned from the sword of the captain of the Lord of angel armies. Father God, right here, this is holy ground. So Father, I thank you. I call forth. So what I'm doing is prophesying to the destiny of this city, awakening the heart of this city. You'll not live in the reproach of GM. You'll not live in the reproach of a water crisis. For Deuteronomy 8.15 says, He brought water out of the hard rock of Flint for the children of Israel to drink. I've been standing on that word for 20 years, Papa. I thank you for a 20-year shift. I thank you for fire water that intoxicates the bride. Fire water, a river of fire that flows through your throne, from your throne through the Flint rock. Father, I thank you for such a time as this, this holy moment, an expression of the Day of Atonement. Lord, I thank you for sons of that day walking forth. 
Father, I thank you for Joshua Wheeler as the son of that day, a first fruit of teaching priests that will run through the land, taking the apostolic and prophetic word and giving people handles, giving people understanding, skill to understand, more than knowledge, but a divine skill from the Spirit of God, understanding. Let it drip from his lips today, Father God. And let it wash over us. In Yeshua HaMashiach's name, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Amen. So, Father, we thank you for this resurrection moment, this resurrection season. And Father, we're all feeling it. We're all sensing it that this is a critical season for this nation, for the nations of the earth. But it's a critical season for your body and for your bride. And so, Father, I thank you for awakening our hearts to the urgency, the urgency of the hour, but also to what you're speaking and saying, Lord, and that we would respond in this hour with hearts that love you and love your ways, eager, willing to respond, willing to step out to obey. God, we just humble ourselves in your sight. We thank you for a spirit of wisdom and revelation on your body in this hour. We thank you for awakening the heart of your bride. So, Father, open up the scroll to us. Open up our eyes to see. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, everybody, I trust you're doing well. Uh, Resurrection Sunday, uh, whether you're in your homes or a few of you here in person. Um, I kind of prayed it, but, you know, the, the season we're in, uh, it really is a global Passover. It's just so undeniable. You don't have to have, uh, you don't have to be specially gifted. You don't have to have a prophetic bone in your body. Here we are in a season where in this nation and the nations of the earth, people are locked in their homes as the plague is passing by. And, you know, I, I've, I've heard of stories of locusts in, um, in Africa. Uh, just a couple days ago, we had uh, hail on and off here. And, uh, you know, the plagues of Egypt, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I'm not saying this is that, but I, I know that God is getting our attention uh, in this hour. And I think it's, it's critical to, to notice um, and to point out that in any moment like this, there are a lot of things going on. And I hear whether it's on the news or um, other Christians sharing, you know, there's a lot of focus on what the enemy is doing and what the nations are doing and what our government is doing. And those are all dimensions of, of what's happening here. But God is speaking, too. Um, I had the opportunity to hear Mike Bickle share some just perspective on it, and he points out four key things. You know, in any given moment, uh, you've got at least four factors going on, four big players, right? So you've got God who comes in loving uh, discipline, to his body and judgment, you know, judgment isn't a dirty word. It's just when God evaluates the truth of, of, of something. He exposes the reality of, of what something is. And so he comes and we use words like shaking, right? Shake the foundation to reveal what's true, what's plumb and what's not plumb. So in, in any given moment, and, and, and this is a moment where God's coming, he's coming in loving and firm judgment and discipline, there's the rage of the enemy, 
The enemy is always trying to get his hand in, and we've seen how he's overplayed his hand in a lot of different areas. And uh, historically and biblically, that's always come back to bite him in the rear end. <laughs> and we're going to see that happen. This is a year uh, of gathering. This is a year of empowerment. This is a year of harvest. And everything that the enemies tried to steal, where he's tried to literally steal the seed, right? Let the reader understand. Literally tried to steal the seed, he's going to have to pay back, right? We're going to see a multiplication on that seed, I believe, in this hour. So you've got God shaking, you've got Satan raging, you have man sinning, right? That's a player, or, or man in agreement, you know, whether we are in agreement with the Lord or disagreement with the Lord, those factors all play out. And then you have the earth that's groaning right now, right? Groaning for the redemption, groaning for the revelation of the sons of God. So even as we look out into this moment, you know, we can focus on what man is doing. We can focus on what Satan is doing. We can focus on what's happening in the earth. And those are all valid points. But more than anything, we need to know what God is doing and what God is saying. And um, I believe he's saying many things. And I've heard many uh, good words come out during this time. And so what I'm bringing is just a piece of that. So one thing that God is doing as we're in this Passover season, going from Passover to Pentecost, as we count the Omer, uh, Pastor Ed mentioned it, that Passover is a time of deliverance and rescue. God is literally rescuing his people from Egypt. He's rescuing his people from those structures that have kept people in bondage and kept them from walking in the fullness of what it means to be sons of the living God, kings and priests unto their God. So every structure that's blinded people's eyes and kept them in a system of bondage and slavery, building monuments to man's honor, building uh, a name for ourselves, all of those structures are being shaken right now. And there's a great deliverance uh, people are waking up. I just heard an incredible testimony of, of a young lady who uh, just, she, she was in a homosexual lifestyle, totally embraced it, and uh, the Lord met her in a dream during this season. All the distractions of life that, you know, we keep ourselves busy with things, and we keep those nagging thoughts of conviction and, and the Lord coming to us tenderly sometimes. We keep those at bay a lot of times with just the routine of life, and we're able to push those aside. But when all the distractions are tuned out and turned down, there's only so much Facebook and uh, Netflix you can stand before you come face to face with the, the emptiness of it. <laughs> Not that those things are bad in and of themselves, but a lot of times we use those to self-medicate. And there's only so much of that you can take before you come face to face with your own barrenness. And so she had this encounter with the Lord. He came to her dream. And uh, I believe that he's doing that all over uh, the nations of the earth right now. Uh, he's waking people up. He's waking up the unbeliever and the believer. He's waking up his bride. So I, I just wrote a few notes here. God is calling his bride back to wholehearted devotion in this hour. He's shaking unstable structures. He's kicking out the props and he's removing false comforts to awaken his bride. I mean, think about it. What would we do if there was no internet right now and no TV? I mean, like, that's about all people have left. There's no sporting events. You can't go out to eat. All these things are being kicked out. You can't even go get seeds and plants and paint to do like little projects to keep yourself busy. It's like you come face to face. It's just you and your family and God. <laughs> And, and we can look at that from many different angles, but what is God doing? What is he speaking to us? I believe he's calling us back into that place of communion and fellowship and intimacy. Um, I had a dream years ago. I think I'll wait to share that in a minute, but it's just coming to my mind. Um, but he's calling his bride back. He's kicking out the props, removing false comforts. At the end, at, at his return, at the end of the age, he will have a bride Fully awake, fully mature, and fully in love. Fully in love with him 
and fully in love with his ways, with his heart, fully in agreement with him, unoffended, right? Because if we were, if we were honest, even as we read the Bible and even as we see how God's worked in our own lives at times, we get offended at, at the Lord's leadership at times when we don't understand it, when we would go a different way. You know, I think about uh, Simon Peter, who when Jesus, he, he gets this great revelation of Jesus, that he's the son of the living God. He's the Messiah. He's the one sent to bring redemption. And then a minute later, he's taking Jesus aside to rebuke him. <laughs> like, Jesus, let me explain your Bible to you. <laughs> like, if we were honest in our heart of hearts, we think we know better sometimes than the Lord. And we would never say that. But when we come face to face and his leadership uh, offends us, it's a revelation to our own hearts. You know, God offends our minds to reveal what's in our hearts at times. And so he's wakening his bride. And she's going to be fully awake, fully mature and fully in love. So I believe that there's many dimensions to this. Um, but we've been re if you've been following along with us in the Bible reading, we've been reading through the book of Jeremiah. We're about halfway through. Jeremiah is actually the longest book in the Old Testament, uh, just by sheer word count. You know, it's got less chapters than the Psalms or Isaiah, but it's got more words than any other book in the Old Testament. So uh, God bless you as you're reading through Jeremiah. Uh, and it is an intense book, uh, but I believe it is a now word for us. It is a timely word. So Jeremiah 2.2, 2, I believe that God is speaking on many levels, but he's speaking to his bride. He's speaking to his people, and he's also calling out to the shepherds, to the leaders uh, of the bride, the, the leaders in the body of Christ. So Jeremiah 2.2, 2, he comes to his people with this word. He says, I remember the devotion of your youth. Your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness, in a land not sown. He's coming to a nation that is in a state of distraction. Running this way and that way after other lovers, after other desires. Their affections have gone to this nation or to that nation, to this God or to that God, anything to prop them up. And this is something maybe is difficult for us to understand, but these gods that they would go after, they're, they're not just, I don't know how to, how to say this, they're not just going after gods because it's just the latest fad. These gods are connected to stability, security, finance, food, fertility, all kinds of things that we treasure and we look for in life, right? And so these are things that we look to as well. We might not attach gods and spirits to them the way that they did because we're so smart in the Western world. But don't be fooled. There are real spirits behind this. Like Jesus attaches a spirit to money. He calls it mammon. That if we worship that, there's a spiritual dynamic to that uh, going on. And so Israel's affections have gone every which way. And God is calling them back to that first love, to wholehearted devotion when it was just him and them in the wilderness. He says, I remember that. And you, if you remember the wilderness story, you're like, wait a second. <laughs> like Israel was constantly complaining and grumbling and going back on God during that time. He's like, I remember the devotion of your youth because it was just you and me. You had to depend on me for daily bread. You weren't looking to the land and you weren't looking to Baal or Baal in American speak, right? <laughs> you weren't looking to Baal to give you the rains and to uh, make your land fertile, but you had to literally trust me for your daily bread, the devotion of your youth. I want it like it was back then, Israel, where every day you were looking forward to the bread that I would bring you. 
Every day you were looking to me for sustenance. When your sandals and your clothes didn't wear out, when your strength was not abated, when your vigor uh, was not gone, that, that you were literally trusting on me for everything. Your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness. But he goes on to say, this is not how you're living right now, Israel. Same chapter, verse 11 of Jeremiah 2. Has a nation changed its gods, even though they are no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked. Be utterly desolate, declares Yahweh, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. He says, you've committed two evils. You've forsaken me, the very fountain, the very source of life itself. And you've gone after all these other lovers and those other lovers, whether it's, uh, again, you know, money, security, sex, pleasure, whatever it is, those gods that you've gone after that you think are somehow propping you up, making you secure, keeping you safe, fulfilling you, satisfying the yearnings of your heart. They're like these broken cisterns that you've tried to hew out for yourselves, but they're broken. They can't even supply water in and of themselves, and they can't even hold water. You just keep dumping your affections into them. You just keep dumping your time, but you see the emptiness of it. Have we experienced that in our own lives where we pour so much time, so much energy, so much affection, and it's just like a bottomless pit that's like, is that all you got? And you come face to face with the emptiness of it. And I believe in this hour, not just for the unbeliever, but for the believers that are caught up in distractions, even good things, good Christian things. But God says it's distracting you from the one thing. Sitting at my feet, hearing my word, responding to my voice. They're broken cisterns that hold no water. He goes on in the same chapter. He says, uh, verse 20, for long ago, I broke your yoke and burst your bonds. But you said, I will not serve. Yes, on every high hill and under every green tree, you bowed down like a harlot. Now, my version says another word, but in case little ears are listening, let the reader understand. It says, you bowed down under every, on every high hill and under every green tree. Now, many of you know that Eden was a garden, but it was also a mountain. So if you, this lush green garden on a high place, which was a place where God and man dwelled together. So what, what you're seeing here, the green tree on a high hill, these are high places of idolatry where they worshipped other gods. But if you can picture it, they're like a false Eden, right? You have a high place, just like the Eden mountain, and you have a green, some translations say a spreading tree or a luxuriant tree. It's kind of a hard word to translate. Uh, actually, if you look at the word there, so the word Eden is three letters. It's ayan, dalit, noon, and the word here for the green or luxuriant tree is ra'anan, and it's the same letters as Eden except the dalit uh, becomes a resh, and those letters actually in Hebrew are almost identical. They're hard to tell apart. There's just a little, little hook on the end of the one that you can distinguish the dalit uh, from the resh. And so Ra'anan is like Eden, but some of the letters have been flipped or inverted. So it's like an inverted or a twisted Eden. You see the picture? Another high hill, a green tree, but it's like a flipped or a perverted, a twisted Eden. It's a false Eden. It's a false hope. It's a false comfort. It's a false place of delight and pleasure, but it's not the place of intimacy. It's not the place that God has ordained for him and man to dwell together. It's a false Eden. 
So he says, this is what you're going after. You're going after these broken cisterns that can't hold any water. You've built for yourself your own Edens, your false gardens that you look for pleasure and fulfillment and satisfaction, but it's not going to work. It says in verse 21, yet I planted you a choice vine, holy of pure seed. How then have you turned degenerate and become a wild vine? Though you wash yourself with lye and use much soap, the stain of your guilt is still before me, declares the Lord Yahweh. How can you say, I am not unclean? I have not gone after the bales. Look at your way in the valley. Know what you have done. A restless young camel running here and there. A wild donkey used to the wilderness in her heat, sniffing the wind. Who can restrain her lust? None who seek her need weary themselves. In her mouth, or in her month, they will find her. Excuse me. So the picture of Israel here, uh, Jeremiah just goes for the jugular here. I mean, it's very explicit. Uh, It's not PG. (laughs) The picture that he paints of the nation is of this camel walking back and forth, just aimlessly wandering. Lots of of moving back and forth, but you're going nowhere. You're looking this way and that way, but there's no movement. There's no direction. It's aimless. There's no purpose. And then the other picture is of a female donkey in heat, uh, just looking for any lover, any satisfaction. That it says that in her, in the time of her month, nobody needs to look for her. They'll find her, right? <laughs> And the, this picture is looking for anything to satisfy, anything to bring satisfaction of desire, totally moved by appetite, impulse, no commitment, no faithfulness, no purpose. Whatever will fill me, whatever will satisfy me, wandering back and forth, no purpose, aimless. This is the picture he paints, and I imagine... It's offensive when I read it. I imagine for Israel, for like the religious leaders to hear this, like, wh- how dare you compare us to something as vile and <laughs> as that? And he said, this is what God says you look like to me right now. This is what you look like to me. So distracted, moving here and there for anything that will fill the void, anything that will satisfy Isaiah 1, let's just kind of bring this verse in. In verse 29 and 30, Isaiah says, speaking of the people and those who refuse to turn, he says, for they shall be ashamed of the oaks that you desired, and you shall blush for the gardens that you have chosen. For you shall be like an oak whose leaf withers and like a garden without water. Isaiah is painting the same picture of a false Eden. And he actually uses words straight out of Genesis. Genesis 2 and 3. You remember when it says that uh, man and uh, woman were naked and they were not ashamed? But when they saw the tree, it says they desired it. And when they ate of the fruit, immediately shame. And God's saying the same thing here. He's saying these oaks, these false Edens, these false places of worship that you've appointed, you've tried to establish your own gardens apart from me. You're going to be ashamed of those things that you've run after, the things that you've desired after, the things that you've tried to fill the void with. You're going to be ashamed of them, and your leaf will wither, and you'll be like a garden without water. Again, broken cisterns. With no water. So God's exposing the vanity. He's exposing the emptiness. And he's talking to his people. The ones he's in covenant with. The ones that he brought out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. The ones that he called to be a kingdom of priests unto himself. He's saying, my people, this is what you're doing. This is what you look like to me. But he doesn't leave them without hope. Remember how he started in Jeremiah 2. He says, I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride. I want it like it was back then. 
I'm calling you back to that place, my people. I'm calling you back. So I've purposely turned down the distractions, tuning out the distractions because I'm trying to awaken you. I'm trying to call you unto myself. Are you listening? Or are you just going to turn on another distraction? Are you just going to run here and run there and try and fill that void? You'll find it to be empty. You'll find it to be a broken cistern that holds no water. You'll find it to be a false garden. You'll find that your leaf is withering and there's no water. And so we've come face to face with that that barrenness, even within ourselves. I don't want to exclude myself from this. This isn't just for those people out there. This is a wake-up call for us. I thought we were going to hear a Resurrection Sunday message. This is a resurrection message. There can't be a resurrection without a death. We come before the Lord. We lay ourselves at his feet, and he resurrects new life. So then he goes on. That was kind of focusing on the people there in those first few chapters of Jeremiah. But he's going to go on and he's going to talk about the leaders. So Jeremiah 23 in verse 1, he says, Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, declares Yahweh. Therefore, thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people. You have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for your evil deeds, declares Yahweh. Then I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I've driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. The original mandate that we were given, right? God's like, I'm going to bring this forth. I'm going to make my people fruitful and multiply. And if I have to remove the wicked shepherds and I have to shepherd my people personally, I will do that. God's mode is to use people. And when people become a veil between him and his people, sometimes he has to rend that veil. And so he's coming to the shepherds here and he's saying, I'm going to overturn you because you've not, you've not tended to my people. And I'm going to bring my people unto myself. They will be fruitful. They will multiply. They will fulfill the mandate that I created them for. And then he says in verse 4, And I will set shepherds over them who will care for them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed. Neither shall any be missing, declares Yahweh. So what an indictment, even in our day and age. Could it be that God is speaking to the shepherds and to the leaders, that things have been tuned way down where we can't even gather in the way that we used to, especially in large settings? And uh, I know this isn't the heart of many leaders in the body of Christ, but could it be that the weekly gathering, or maybe twice if we're radical, right? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the, the weekly gathering has served to prop up many of the shepherds' sense of self-worth and self-importance, that we've revolved things around numbers, and that somehow has to do with our reach and look at what we're doing for the kingdom, but maybe what we're building is monuments in our own honor sometimes, where we're keeping the people in bondage, where we're not speaking truth because we're afraid to offend. We're afraid that the money will stop flowing and we have to keep the machine going so we just add a little grease to the cogs because that's how we look at the people, right? They're just cogs in our machine, right? Our whatever you want to call it, our Sunday service machine. It's just interesting that we even call it Sunday service, you know, that the the people are all in a state of service, right? Right? Serving the machine, serving the Pharaoh, building the monuments. And I know this isn't the heart of many leaders, but he's tuned much of that way down. And I've at least heard the testimony of a few that have talked to some of their pastor friends. And they're like, in just a little bit, everything's going to go back to normal. Beloved, we can't go back to normal. (laughs) We can't go back to business as usual. 
I was having a conversation with a friend of mine, and it just struck me. I, you know, we were just commenting on what's happening in the earth right now and how God is awakening his church. And I said, I know one thing. I just, I know that we, it's not time for business as usual. We can't go back to business as usual. And he said, yep, it wasn't working anyway. I was like, whoa. <laughs> it was just that little like, that's right. It wasn't working anyway, but we think as long as the money's flowing and the people's going, it props up, especially as leaders, our sense of importance and self-worth, and I want people to be happy with me, and I, I want to feel good about the message that I have to bring, and they're just props that God needs to kick out. We weren't meant to just revolve around a personality. If I look at the fivefold gifts, the purpose of them is not to centralize everything on one building one day a week. It's to equip a whole body of believers to do the work of the ministry Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So in, in many ways, just what's happened right now has just decentralized so much of the body, and that's actually a really healthy thing. Now, I believe in leadership, but it's not just so that we can prop up one man or a team of leaders. We're equipping a body to be the body, to do the work. It's not about a building. It's about a planting of the Lord, a place that and again, not a building, but where people can flourish and grow in what God has placed in each one of them. I, I think of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 9. He says, um, well, he doesn't say this, but it says, when he saw the crowds, verse 36, um, it says he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Now, this is a phrase you actually find throughout the Old Testament. First time you see it in Numbers is in Numbers 27 when God tells Moses, like, because of your disobedience, you're not going to enter into the promise. And Moses said, well, God, then appoint another leader so that they, the people not be like sheep without a shepherd. And so the idea of sheep without a shepherd is people with no leadership. I believe in leadership, but we need true shepherds who, number one, are shepherds after his own heart. We'll get to that in a minute. And from that place, they care for the people. They tend to the sheep. We can't get the order wrong because when we get the order wrong, we get that flipped. We get that reversed thing where it's all about uh, it's all about the man or it's all about keeping the money flowing or keeping the people happy. And that's not a forward movement. <laughs> that's just a again cogs in the machine. So he says they were like sheep without a shepherd, harassed. And I think it's interesting, the, the timing of that phrase in Matthew even, that who was, who was Moses talking about when he says, appoint another leader so they be not like sheep without a shepherd? Well, that leader was Joshua, right? Joshua would lead them into the promise. And here, Yeshua, which comes from Joshua, Yehoshua, here he sees that the people are like sheep without a shepherd. And the very next thing he does is Matthew 10. He appoints 12, just like the 12 tribes of Israel. It's a new movement. Jesus is the shepherd, the good shepherd, he calls himself. He's the chief shepherd, the shepherd of our souls. And it's not that Israel had lack for leaders. Israel had many leaders, many voices, many Groups all vying for the attention of the people. We might use the word denominations today. They had the Pharisees. They had the Sadducees. They had the Zealots over here. Everybody's vying for the nation, vying for the attention of the people, saying, come over here, do what we're doing. We've, we're the true move of God. We're what's really happening. We've got it going on. Come over here. And Jesus sees there's no real shepherds. There's men calling people unto themselves, but nobody is following the true shepherd, Yahweh. Nobody's inquiring of the Lord. And to be a true leader, you need to be following the shepherd, right? Because when you're following the shepherd of your souls, sometimes he'll call you to do things and say things 
that won't win you uh, favor in friends, <laughs> right? Won't win you popularity. So he sees it's not that there was a lack of leaders, but there was a lack of true leadership, true shepherds, many leaders, many teachers, but few fathers, few true shepherds. So Jeremiah goes on to talk about the shepherds uh, in Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 13. He says, for from the least to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for unjust gain. And from prophet to priest, everyone deals falsely. They've healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. They've healed the wound of my people lightly. Just put a little oil on it, right? Keep the cogs moving. Keep the machine going. Don't call out the compromise. Don't call people to wholehearted devotion. Don't expose the severity of it. Just put a little oil on it. Put a little word on it. Make the people feel better. This isn't to beat up on the people. It's not to beat up on the shepherds even. It's to call us back to that place of wholehearted devotion. The devotion of your youth. So he says, they've healed the wound of my people lightly. Jeremiah 23 actually goes on to say in verse 21, I did not send these prophets, yet they ran. I did not speak to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, then they would have proclaimed my words to my people, and they would have turned from their evil way and from the evil of their deeds. We need to stand in his counsel. It's the testimony of so many of the prophets. Elijah says, the God before whom I stand, I have stood in the counsel of the, of the Lord. I've marked and I've perceived his word. And this is the word that he's given to me. And in Jeremiah's case, it was an incredibly unpopular word. It was not a populist message, right? Jeremiah... Um, Heavily influenced by the De book of Deuteronomy. I mean, all the prophets were, but in Jeremiah especially, you'll notice if you've read Deuteronomy a few times through, there's tons of phrases lifted right out of Deuteronomy that find their way in Jeremiah. And one of them, uh, Jeremiah says, uh, just like it says in Deuteronomy, he says, see, I've set before you life and death, the way of life and the way of death. And guess what the way of life was? Surrender yourself to the Babylonians. That's, that's what he says. Here's the way of life. Surrender to the Babylonians. Go into exile. And the way of death is stay in the city of Jerusalem because you will uh, experience pestilence and plague and you will be killed. That's not a popular message. It's like, I've got a word from Deuteronomy for you. And they're like, amen, brother, let's hear it. He's like, here's the way of life. Give yourself up to the occupying army. <laughs> That's the way of life. And the way of death is stand in the city, right? They're like, no, no, we read Isaiah. Isaiah said that God is going to save us. He's going to bring salvation. He's like, that was for Assyria. This is Babylon. That was then. This is now. God's got a different word for you, and it's not a popular one. So if they had stood in my council, they would have proclaimed my words to my people. Here's Jeremiah 5, speaking of the, the priest and the prophet and of the leaders. It says uh, in 27, like a cage full of birds, their houses are full of deceit. Therefore, they've become great and rich. They have grown fat and sleek. They know no bounds in deeds of evil. They judge not with justice the cause of the fatherless to make it prosper, and they do not defend the rights of the needy. Shall I not punish them for these things, declares Yahweh, and shall I not avenge myself on a nation such as this? An appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. Here's the key. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule at their direction. My people love to have it so. But what will you do when the end comes? I didn't send these prophets. They haven't stood in my counsel, but they went anyway. 
I think he goes on in Jeremiah 23 to say they prophesy out of their own delusions, out of their own imaginations, out of their own souls, what they'd like to see happen, what the people want to hear. And they say, I've had a dream, I've had a dream. And God's like, enough with your dreams. He even says, uh, <laughs> he says, if anyone comes to you, Jeremiah, and says, what's the burden of the Lord? Jeremiah was to say, you're the burden. And God's going to cast you off. Because you've been lying to my people. You've been prophesying falsely. You haven't spoken the truth. The truth that will save them. So he says the prophets prophesy falsely and the priests rule at their own direction. At their, dis- or their direction. He says my people love to have it so. But what will you do? What, how will you respond my people? What will you do when the end comes? When it all comes crashing down? And here's the response. This is in Jeremiah 3. I believe this is, this is what he's calling his people to, his shepherds to. He says in Jeremiah 3, verse 14, he says, Return, O faithless children, declares the Lord, for I am your master. I will take you, from one, uh, one from a city and two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. Verse 15, And I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. And when you have multiplied and been fruitful, there it is again, bringing them back to original intent. When you have multiplied and been fruitful in the land in those days, declares Yahweh, they shall no more say the ark of the covenant of Yahweh. It shall not come to mind or be remembered or missed. It shall not be made again. What are you talking about, Jeremiah? Why why would we not remember the Ark of the Covenant? Why would we not want to make it again? Though they're taking us into exile, though they're destroying our temple, why would we not want to make it again? He's like, it won't even be brought to mind. It won't even be missed. And they say, That's the very throne of Yahweh. It's the footstool for his feet. Why would we not want to make it again? And he says in verse 17, at that time, Jerusalem, the whole city, the land shall be called the throne of Yahweh. And all nations shall gather to it, to the presence of Yahweh in Jerusalem. And they shall no more stubbornly follow their evil heart. He's calling his people, don't you see? Even the structure of the tabernacle and the temple was to awaken you to the reality of the garden that I've always been working to restore in my people. You're not just going to come back to a box and to a structure. I want to inhabit cities. I want to inhabit nations. I want to inhabit my people. So he calls them to a place of repentance and he says, if you return, if you come back to me, if you turn, I will give you shepherds after my own heart. He's recalling David to their minds, right? David was a shepherd in the fields who was called to shepherd God's people. And he was said to be a man after God's own heart. He says, I'm going to give you David's who have been faithful in the fields of obscurity. Not self-important in their own eyes, jockeying for position and honor. They've been faithful with a few things, and they've been faithful to go after the things of my heart. These are the shepherds that are going to feed my people. These are the ones that are going to feed you with knowledge and with understanding. So he's calling to the shepherds, In this hour, he's calling to the people, he's calling all of us to return to the Lord. Jeremiah 6, 16, thus says Yahweh, stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and find rest for your souls. But they said we will not walk in it. So he's saying. Remember, I remember the devotion of your youth. I'm calling you back to that. Israel, call to me. Ask for the ancient paths. 
the good way is, or the good way, and walk in that way, and you will find rest for your souls. It doesn't mean that there's no work element to it. It doesn't mean we don't do anything, but there's no striving on the inside. There's a joyous partnership with the Lord in submission to him and to his will, right? There's no commission without submission to the primary mission, right? (laughs) But he's calling us back to original intent. He's calling us back to the garden. He's saying, ask for the ancient paths. I'm calling you back to original intent. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. I immediately think of Jesus where he says, come to me, all who are All who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is calling us back to his way. And if we can uh, have some music and prepare to take communion, and for those of you in your own homes, if you've got some communion, Let's come to the Lord together. And again, I don't want to just point fingers at this congregation or this leader or that leader. That's that's not my intent or my heart. But I believe the Lord is calling all of us. Whether whether we're considered the people or the shepherds, really, we're all shepherds. (laughs) We all have a sphere of influence that God has given us a people, whether it's our family whether it's those uh, in our jobs, whether it's our circle of friends, we are all called to be shepherds on some level. So that call is really to all of us to be shepherds after his own heart. So he's calling his people to return. He's saying, ask for the ancient paths. Seek me out. Return, my people. Come back. Come back to wholehearted devotion. There's a way, there's a yoke, there's a way of understanding what I'm doing. There's a way of understanding the kingdom and the world that's an easy yoke, where there's no striving, where there's no running this way and running that way, searching for satisfaction, searching for fulfillment. There's a way of walking in the ancient paths that's in stride with me, that's in step with me. He says, take my yoke upon you. I'm the, I'm the strong ox, right? Take my yoke upon you, and you'll have an easy load. It doesn't mean life is easy, but it means that there's a rest. There's a sense of it is finished. And even as we look at this resurrection season, that's the place that we work from, right? We work from a place of rest. A place of it is finished. Just as God finished his work and on the seventh day he rested and he puts man and woman in a garden of rest. And then he says, from that place of rest, he's like, work it. I've called you to work. I want you to partner with my heart. It's a joyous partnership. But you're working from a place of rest, from a place of delight, from a place of rest in your soul. Because the real work is already finished. And so our call is to walk with him, to partner with him, to walk in the spirit, right? It's what he was doing when he came and he called to Adam and Eve. He says, Adam, where are you? And God is walking in the cool of the day. The word is ruach there. It's the spirit. God is walking in the spirit. And Paul goes on to say in Galatians 5, when you walk in the spirit... You won't fulfill the deeds or the desires of the flesh, right? You won't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You won't go after this lover and that lover, trying to find satisfaction, trying to fill the void, trying to fill desire. We all do this on some level or another. We have distractions, and God's He's tuned it way down because he's calling us. He's alluring us in this hour. So he says, I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride. And I want it back, my people. I want that devotion back. 
he calls to the church in Ephesus. He says, I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance, how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but you've tested those who've called themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. He says, you're doing all this good work, many good things. You're enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake. And you've not grown weary. Like You guys are doing so much, but I have this against you. You have abandoned the love that you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. He's calling us back to wholehearted devotion. Just a couple more scriptures and then we'll take communion. I think it was about a week ago, maybe a little bit more than that. I woke up in the morning and there was, a, we'd had a few warm days, but then we had a thin blanket of snow on the whole ground. And I just immediately thought of Isaiah 1. Even in the midst of our own as, as his bride, our own compromise. God comes and he says in Isaiah 1.18, Come now, let us reason together, says Yahweh. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. And here's the key. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel... You shall be eaten by the sword, for the mouth of Yahweh has spoken. So there's, I believe, in this, even in the midst of our own distractions, our good Christian distractions, as the, the emptiness of it has been exposed, God still put a door of hope in front of us. He says, let's, let's reason together. Like, you... He said earlier in Jeremiah, he said, you can't wash yourself of this. You can't clean yourself of this. You can use all the soap you want. You can wash your hands as many times as you want. Sing happy birthday twice, whatever it takes. You can't cleanse yourself of this. But come to me. Return to me. And you'll eat the good of the land. You'll be white as snow. So where's the resurrection in all this? I, I think we see it in Hosea chapter 6. He says in verse 1, Come, let us return to Yahweh, for He has torn us, that He may heal us. He has struck us down, and He will bind us up. After two days, He will revive us. On the third day, He will raise us up, that we may live before Him. Let us know. Let us press on to know Yahweh. His going out is as sure as the dawn. He will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. It's a resurrection call. It's a resurrection message. He says, return to me. Lay it all down. Lay it all down on the altar, and I will resurrect you. I will bring new life. And he says, on the third day. Here we are. Churches all over the nations of the earth celebrating that third day of resurrection. It's a pattern you see throughout Scripture. Genesis 22, on the third day, Abraham takes Isaac up the mountain to offer him as a sacrifice. And he sees the ram in the thicket. And so there's new life resurrection, one in place for the other, on a mountain, and then God reaffirms his covenant. Exodus 19, he brings his people through the waters of baptism, through the Red Sea, to a mountain, and he says, get ready for the third day. And he comes, and he covenants with his people, and he commissions his people. We're in a season right now, from Passover to Pentecost, going to the mountain of the Lord. He's redeemed and he's delivered his people. He's delivering them from bondage in Egypt, delivering them from those structures and systems that have kept them in bondage. And he's bringing them to the mountain of the Lord and coming on the third day. 
with a word of resurrection, restoring the covenant, restoring original intent, commissioning his people from that place. It's new life. It's restoring covenant and original intent. And it's coming to the mountain of Yahweh. So last, last scripture, I promise, Hosea 2. The Lord just was impressing this on my heart even during worship. He says, this is what I'm doing with my bride. Verse 14 of Hosea 2, he says, Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And there I will give her her vineyards in the wilderness, in the place where you wouldn't think that life could grow. In a place of death, he says, There I will give her her vineyards and make the valley of Achor, the valley of, of trouble. It was the valley where the compromise, they came face to face with the compromise of Achan and his family. And there was a death. They had to stone the whole family. So the nation comes face to face with their own covenant unfaithfulness and compromise. And there's a death. He says, I'm going to take that place of disobedience and compromise and death, and I will make it a door of hope. He says, and there she shall answer as in the days of her youth. Remember what Jeremiah 2 said, I remember the days of your youth. Hosea saying, I'm going to allure my people. I'm going to allure my bride, and I'm going to bring them back to that place. I'm going to make a door of hope. She shall answer as in the days of her youth, as at the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. And in that day, declares Yahweh, you will call me my husband and no longer call me my Baal. For I will remove the names of the Baals from her mouth and they shall be remembered by name no more. And I will make for them a covenant on that day with the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens and the creeping things of the ground. It's calling back the covenant in Genesis 1 where you have two sets of three days, right? God says, let there be light. He parts the waters, and then on day three, dry land comes forth, and out of the ground comes forth vegetation, comes forth new life. And then you have another set of three days, and out of the ground, day six, God brings forth man from the ground, and he covenants with him. And he says, I've made you in my image to rule and to reign with me, to be fruitful and to multiply this covenant. So he says here to his people, I'm going to bring you into the wilderness. You're going to call me my husband. And I'll make a covenant that day. I'm going to restore you back to original intent. That covenant I made in Genesis 1 for you to be co-heirs, rulers, ruling and reigning with me over creation, over the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. I'm going to covenant with you once again. I'm going to restore the original intent it says, I will abolish the bow, the sword, and war from the land, and I will make you lie down in safety, and I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know Yahweh. So God, on this Resurrection Sunday, on this Passover season and on this first fruits we look to you our fountain of living water we come to you Father and we bow down before you God I repent of being caught up in even good distractions Father, we turn our eyes to you. We thank you for a people of single-eyed single, single -eyed devotion. Completely committed to you. So we call to the bride of Christ. We call to the body. We say, return, my people. Return. Return to the Lord. 
We thank you, Jesus, for the deliverance that you brought about through your broken body, through your shed blood. And you're delivering your bride even now in this hour as a global Passover is occurring all across the nations of the earth. We thank you for awakening your bride and awakening your body. We thank you for calling us back to the place of wholehearted devotion, for alluring us even into the wilderness where you've tuned out all the distractions, where we come face to face with you. So we return to you, Jesus. We return to our first love. We return back to the ancient paths, to the good way. We take your yoke upon us. I thank you for new life springing up. I thank you for testimonies of salvation. I thank you for your bride becoming fiery hot in her love for you, fully awake, fully mature, fully in love with you. So Jesus, we thank you for your body broken for us. We thank you that you made a way for us to enter into the garden, to come into the presence of the Lord unashamed. So we, we receive an impartation from you today. Thank you for the veil of your body being rent, making a way for us. We partake of the bread in Jesus' name. We thank you for the blood of the new covenant. You've redeemed us. I thank you for men and women waking up in this hour. That you would break us out of our slavery mentality and bring us into the freedom and the fullness of the sons of God. Not free to do what we will, but free to serve you with all of our hearts and all of our souls. We thank you for new minds and new hearts. And as your body, we step into the mind of Christ. We take it on in Jesus' name. We forsake our ways. We forsake distractions. We're in a covenant with you. You are our husband. We are your bride. We belong to you, spirit, soul, and body. And so we thank you for a people returning back to covenant roots, returning back to wholehearted devotion. Not caught up in distractions, not going just with the cultural stream, but a people who follow the Lamb wherever He leads. And so we thank you, Lamb of God, for your blood. We thank you for the covenant that you've made and you've sealed with that blood. We receive in Jesus' name as we take the cup. So God, I thank you for a resurrection of your bride in this hour. We declare that we belong to you, Jesus spirit, soul, and body, unreservedly. We are yours, Jesus. We thank you for the bride awakening in this hour. We thank you for the heart of your bride awakening. Wake up. Wake up, sleeping bride. We thank you for a resurrection. A resurrection in the bride of Christ. 
We thank you for the shepherd's awakening. Standing in your counsel. Shepherds after your very heart. We thank you that sleeping beauty is awakening in this hour. choose today this one thing I choose today I choose to seek your face to gaze upon your beauty to sit at your feet to be a lay down lover Lord I thank you we return as a people as a family as an individual we return thank you for this opportunity that you've given us that you've shut everything down to show us the foxes that are spoiling the vine. Lord, I thank you. Forgive me for where I've complained instead of returning to rest. Thank you for this word, Lord, like a surgeon's knife that has just cut away and exposed Lord, I thank you for this word. Let us muse upon this word. Let us not run past this word quickly. Circumcise my heart. Circumcise my ear. That I might hear. Kept hearing the Lord say, If you'll return the rest, you'll eat of the best. And then you'll see what I've prepared for you. You've been running here and there and there where I've prepared a table for you. If you'll return the rest, you will see. You'll see me with unveiled face. And I'll send you forth as a son, as a daughter of rest. And I'll make you a place where my spirit will rest and remain. So Jesus... I've done just that. I have run here and there many times and I failed to see that you have a table prepared right before my face if I would just stop and see. 
So, Lord, I thank you. Help us to not move quickly. Help us to muse as we're going from Shabbat to Shabbat, counting seven Shabbats up to your mountain of Pentecost, of encounter. Help us to understand seven. Help us to understand Shabbat. Help us to understand rest. Lord, I thank you for this word. And Lord, let us listen to it again and muse upon these scriptures and others. Take us on a journey into rest. You're our good shepherd. You make us lie down in green pastures. You lead us by the still waters. Lord, you restore our soul, and we return to you. Lord, I thank you for an exchange in homes today. Lord, where there's been turmoil, pain, and trial, and tribulation, and anxiety, and chaos. Lord, I thank you for an, an exchange. I thank you for rest for the weary soul. And Lord, even in the midst of chaos, Jesus reminded me this week of him sleeping in the hull of the ship in the midst of chaos of a storm. He was sleeping. He was in a place of rest. And he showed me that even though there will be much chaos in the days to come, that there's a place in the hull of the ship where I can rest and be unmoved by the storms that rage around me, that I could I could go down in a place with him that I could rest with him in a place in the hull of the ship even though there's a storm raging and tossing the ship that I'm in that place with him I'm literally with him in the hull of the ship resting and sleeping while everyone else is frantic Lord you spoke that to me and thank you that you gave this word to Joshua because he is a Joshua generation and Lord I thank you for this word today. And I thank you, Lord, for our lives, our families, for uh, this place called Gateway Hope Center. I thank you for the door of hope opening. And for, Lord, all those that might be listening in from different parts of the nation, Lord, I thank you that the door of hope is open before them. And I thank you for them walking in a place they've never walked before as a son and daughter of rest, working from rest, releasing that full measure of the Spirit. So, Father, I thank you as we go throughout our day, Lord, and might even have activity. Lord, I thank you that our spirits are postured in a place of rest, of it is finished. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. That was a good word, and so, amen. God bless you.